Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Julio Godinez, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, How to Secure Investments and Hang On to Top Talent, brought to you by TaskTop. We have a great webinar for you today, but before we get started, I need to go through some housekeeping announcements. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any part of the webinar, you will be able to access the recording for on-demand viewing. We will be sending out a link to access the webinar on demand, or you can visit DevOps.com slash webinars. We want to hear from you, so please feel free to send in your questions at any time throughout the program by using the Q&A tab. We also encourage discussion by using the chat tab, so let us know your thoughts or just say a quick hello. Finally, stick around until the end because we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards, so stay tuned to see if you're a winner. Joining me today is David Slater, Product Value Stream Lead, TaskTop, and Carmen DeArdo, Senior Director, VSM Research and Design at TaskTop. And with that, I'm going to put myself on mute, turn off my camera, and let you begin. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Julio. So like uh, Julio said, today we're going to be talking about how to secure investment and hang on to top talent and platform delivery teams. Uh, I got to just start off with a little bit more of an introduction for Carmen and I. So I'm David Slater, uh, uh, the Product Value Stream Lead here at TASOP for uh, what is our platform team. We provide uh, the platform as a service for development and also for our customer facing infrastructure. Um, so Carmen, why don't you go ahead and give yourself a little bit more of an introduction? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, David. So I'm Carmen Diardo. I uh, work on the product team also with David. I also interact with customers to get feedback on um, what they would like to see in terms of new, um, new capabilities for value stream management. And I'm happy to be here. All right. So there's two of us today. Uh, so Carmen's going to be here helping me provide some, you know, uh, color commentary, but also helping us spot questions and interrupting me when, when we have a question. Uh, so we really encourage you to ask questions as we go. We, we want sort of the interruption as we go. There's definitely going to be some time at the end as well if you want to ask questions then. Uh, but it's great if you, if you can ask as we go. All right, so I'll jump into it. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what do we mean by the, the platform team? So what we mean are the, the, is really the IT for IT. These are the teams that are providing you know, provisioning test environments, uh, creating deployment pipelines uh, that, that service in the end, uh, the sort of the top level business products that that companies are selling, you know, and, and in between that are, are the internal products, which are the, you know, internal APIs or SDKs that the, the business product capabilities are built on, on top of. Uh, so what we're talking about today in terms of, of investment and retention and retention, especially, you know, we're not talking about our, uh, you know, PTO or, or that sort of retention, but more on the side of creating a team that understands the value and, and is really engaged and, and happy uh, from that. So platform teams are so uh, important to the, the organization and especially the business product because they provide, uh, you know, the foundation for the value delivery that's flowing through the organization. And it's a big problem if they're insufficiently funded. <clears throat> so, you know, and, and that's a very typical problem that you have on platform teams uh, is, is sort of, uh, the, you know, how does it get uh, demonstrate the value? How do you get sufficient continuous investment? So some common things you might see on a platform team, you know, I, I think anybody that's worked on a team kind of has seen this and some people even wear it as sort of a badge of honor. You know, they only notice us when things go wrong or uh, we're doing a good job and they don't notice us. <clears throat> I think this can sort of drive a lack of feeling valued on teams and, and it's not really something you want for, you know, to be unnoticed as a platform team. You really want to be recognized for the, return on investment you give to the organization and not just being seen as sort of a traditional cost center that, that you're always trying to reduce the cost of. Platform teams really should be viewed as, as an investment vehicle to really uh, uh, drive a competitive edge in that company. Like I say, they, they are the basis for all the rest of the product development. <laughs> um, another sort of challenge you can have on a, on a platform team is, is sort of more initiative-based or project-based funding rather than continued investment. So. Uh, the funding is more uh, based on some big project like a migration or, or you know, a move to a new piece of software or even introducing a new uh, uh, service or, or piece of software for teams to use and then kind of never touching it again. The, the funding lasts the, the length of the project to introduce it. And another sort of cha another challenge of working on a platform team is getting stuck in sort of cycles of local optimizations that aren't really informed by your internal customers or the data. So, you know, these are these are making improvements to things that aren't really 
having a big impact on the value that you're delivering to your customers, the value that's flowing through your, your platform to your internal customers. <clears throat> and this can really sort of lead to some happiness on teams as well, because it can start to feel futile. You're making improvements, but it doesn't really seem to be making anyone uh, more effective. You're putting money into things, but you're not really getting any business outcomes that you want. And, you know, in terms of team interaction as well, I think it's not uncommon for platform teams to be viewed as a hindrance to the, you know, wait times of waiting for new services to be introduced um, or when, when there's internal sort of customer requests on, on new uh, features. Uh, you know, if left unmanaged, these dependencies left unmanaged, you can, you can get some definitely friction between teams, but it also makes the team, could make the team feel un, unvalued because they're, they're doing their best, but, you know, they can see that they're a bottleneck to wait times to those uh, internal or, or business product teams, uh, which really amplifies up through the organization. All right. And I think anybody who's worked on a platform team or with the platform team can, can really agree that they really are essential for success. And, and a lot of the uh, big successful technology companies really understand this. Like, this is a quote from Microsoft CEO, uh, you know, there cannot be a more important thing for an engineer than to work on systems that drive our productivity. Um, you know, and, and this has obviously been a focus for, for the Fang companies, I guess actually called Mang companies now that Facebook has changed their name. Uh, but they obviously very much appreciate this and put a lot of investment into, into their platforms to the point where, you know, uh, for Amazon, for example, has actually uh, productized their platform. You know, they, they created a platform and then they actually sold that thing because it works so well. So I would, I would really argue that, you know, the platform products that are delivered internally really are part of the product. Uh, they're not distinctly different uh, from the thing that is being delivered to, to the customer. You know, that, that business product is just really the, the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of what, what gets delivered they, you know, the, what the customer sees is really just a small picture of what actually goes into creating that product and everything from, you know, the delivery pipelines and the developer tools and the infrastructure as a service that is being provided there, whether it's customer facing or internal really shapes that end product. Um, and, you know, and every, every sort of the value flowing through every layer really amplifies the success of the, of the next and, and, you know, can have the, the opposite effect as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point, David. I mean, a lot of my experience has been that, you know, and I like the iceberg example, it's kind of that waterline is where the business products are visible. Right? So if you go on a company's website and you look at products and maybe it's an insurance company and they have insurance products or financial products or it's a banking company or whatever it is, you know, an automotive company, you think of cars, right? So if you think of a Ford or a BMW or Stellantis, you think of their models, right? But then once you get into it, you know, under the water, so to speak, are these internal and platform products that are really driving all the value that gets delivered. So the business product can get a lot of attention, the business product can get prioritization, but then as you start to understand how value is flowing and, and this concept of a value stream network, what you find is, all that value is dependent on those internal and platform products. And as David said, they have an amplifying effect. So if you invest there, you get it many times back because of all the business products, you know, the developers of those products that are utilizing it. So you know, being able to shine the light and treat these products as true products, architect them for speed of delivery, um, ensuring that they are an investment opportunity for the company is very important and i think becomes a demarcation between the companies that may be struggling and the companies that are going to do well uh, in terms of how they invest in those platform products yeah absolutely and i i feel like for platform teams a lot of the time especially if if you're struggling it, it can be really hard to actually articulate that value and how it amplifies up through the organization because there's a bit of a disconnect in 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 how that value flows and uh, you know, where it's going. So, you know, how can that be addressed? I, I think what, what I'm really going to be talking about today is, is sort of changing the thinking about how you provide the platform services. So moving from that sort of project aligned thinking and more to product thinking. 
uh, you know, you're, you're seeing this more and more in the software delivery cycle. It's not just the, the product functionals that are being viewed as a product, you know, as a product. I, I would argue sort of that the SRE implementation of DevOps, for example, is just productization of reliability. <clears throat> so I, I think this is a really good thing to just, you know, to, to take that thinking through the entire delivery stack, including the platform products, which I would, as I was saying, I would argue are part of the products that you're delivering. Uh, to use the same thinking that you use on the business products from product management. So, you know, just in a very broad sense, what does that mean? That means knowing your your internal customer and knowing who they are. Uh, being able to define and measure and communicate your value. I think that's one of the most important things is, is to really be able to tell your story and talk about what your return on investment is. That, you know, every dollar here is, you know, three, four or five dollars up the line. Uh, so the teams really want to invest in you and they, they become champions for your investment as well. <clears throat> and also to empower your team, uh, to get really teams really engaged in that, that uh, value delivery and not sort of stuck in those local optimizations and to feel that the, the services that they're providing, the, the platforms that they're providing are, are valued by their customers. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is the customer. Uh, I think for platform teams, sometimes this can be a little bit difficult because you can have a lot of stakeholders, you know, uh, it's not uncommon for the platform teams to have not only sort of development organization stakeholders, but you might also have uh, customer support or, or uh, sales or biz dev as, as stakeholders as well. So defining who they are is really important. So, you know, what, what could that look like? I don't think this will, any of this will look totally out of place of what you would imagine for, for typical software delivery, you know, who's using what I produce, who would care if the product didn't exist. I, I, Carmen said this to me one time, which I really like, you know, if you're, you and your team packed up and turn your pagers off, who would suffer? Those are your customers. Those are the people that depend on the things that you provide. Um, uh, who dictates what I produce, you know, for value creation, increase value, decrease cost, all of that stuff, you know, that, that on a, even on a platform team should be your product manager and, and same with uh, the, you know, the value protection that is really going to be similar to the, the software delivery as well. It's going to be your security officer, or your, you know, your director of risk and security management. Um, and, you know, for me, one of the most important ones is who's paying for what I produce. And this is the place where it starts to separate from sort of more of a business product. And here's, here's sort of an example on a table side by side on how, what the two look like. They're, they're actually pretty similar. Uh, but, you know, in terms of who's paying for you, you're from a platform team perspective, you're getting continuous funding from the organization where the business product is driving revenue from that, that business line. So getting your internal customers to champion investment in you is really important. Uh, you know, that not only telling your own story and, and providing your own value, but also having those internal customers that, that really like the product and want, you know, essentially buy more. And, and I think you know, one of the missteps I see sometimes is, and, and we're coming to the part of the year where this is probably happening with a lot of organizations, is they're looking at OKRs and, and, you know, looking at next year and setting goals and things. And sometimes, you know, you may have a goal as a company to say, we want to retain more customers or do more cross-selling or something. Well, that's fine. But if you just cascade that down to a platform team, it's like, what am I, what does that mean? Right. Those aren't real goals for a platform team. And I've talked to platform teams before and it's like, I don't really feel like I have a part in that. Well, of course you do, but it's not, you know, it's by looking at your customers, right? So that you have customers who have those goals, you know, in order to do that, they need to be able to deliver things more quickly. They need to be able to deliver more, you know, improve their capacity. What does that mean? That means they need environments, they need tooling, they may need monitoring set up in certain in earlier environments to catch things earlier. They're implementing DevOps practices that are relying on your team to improve their own speed of delivery and quality of delivery. And so be, you need to be able to look at it and position things in terms of that platform itself is a product, has customers, has specific success criteria or value that's being produced and and you know that investment then again as david said gets magnified and so put in that context i think is really an enabler for the platform teams 
to be seen and see themselves properly within the organization and be motivated and successful. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, I think one thing is that that platform teams as a, have a, uh, as a huge advantage. I mean, in, in sort of typical product management for a business application, uh, getting that feedback loop at the customer can be really difficult. And I actually think this is a, in, in sort of this framework and sort of productizing your platform, you have a huge advantage in that you have a direct link to that customer feedback. These are your colleagues, these are in, internal customers uh, that you can speak directly to. And, and that just makes that process exactly what Carmen is understanding or talking about in terms of understanding what their what their goals are and what what their challenges are and how how you can help them uh, become so much easier. Uh, yeah, you're not going to just read their OKRs and sort of understand everything they want. You can understand their direction, uh, but you can also talk directly to them and understand why what challenges they're having and what it is they really need to be successful. And that's just something that is very difficult typically to get from a customer. You can get some very agreeable customers that will give you good feedback, but not as consistently as you can as an internal platform team. And so you should be using that to, to help also explain how the platform team is helping them meet their goals, really understand the value you're giving to them and, and to present product roadmaps to them regularly and, and use that really quick feedback loop that you can take advantage of to make sure that roadmap fits what they're trying to do, what their, what their business needs are, what, what they're trying to achieve. <clears throat> We have a couple questions, David. I'll take the easy okay. one. I'll take the easy one and give you the hard one. So, if, <laughs> well, the one question is: our product, our product plat. Hmm, sorry, our platform product customers, the developers, rather than the business. And I would answer yes. I mean, you're the customers of a platform are the developers who are then producing something that eventually may go to the business. Now, the second question, David, and we can kind of tag team on this. It has a couple. Yeah. Of it says, do you believe it is a sound practice to have the platform developers also contribute to the application product? I found learning what I was having other people use enabled me to refine it to make the platform better. So I'll yeah. I'm going to take a shot at that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really, I really think it depends on what your product is like. If, if you're in sort of a more in an SRE model, that's sort of the expectation of part of the product you're providing, right? So you, you may uh, actually uh, change the business application to be more observable to, to put um, uh, you know, metrics into that application so you can better monitor and help the team in sort of a, a consultation engagement, even if you're not directly responsible for that, for that pager. So I absolutely, I think it just depends on what your product is, what's really providing them uh, value. I don't think anybody's going to have from a platform team specifically the exact same product as another company. You may have a lot of similarities, but there are different things that are going to drive value and different things that are difficult within your organization. So, I mean, you still really have to make sure you sort of manage dependencies when you're creating these products because you don't want to get stuck in, uh, uh, the, you know, too many direct dependencies of the team. So they're constantly waiting for you. But I think that's a really important thing to think about in your product is what is that product? Is it, is it, you know, providing sort of those metric endpoints or is it something sort of more distance? It's, you know, I'm providing you a service mesh that you can use and you interface with that, but I don't interact with the application. So, um, thanks David. I'll take a, give a perspective from my prior experience, which was working for a, a fortune 100 insurance and financial company. And, and, you know, this is a company where maybe you had a couple of, you know, up to 10,000 folks in the technology organization. And so we did, um, we did go through a period where we took infrastructure engineers and we had them work mo more closely with a set of um, business products, even in, you know, involving them to be involved in some of their standups so that they could better understand the experience of their customers. I mean, understanding, we talk a lot about personas, especially with business, yeah partners, we talk about personas and who we're selling to or who's using the product. I think I think that also applies to platforms. And so understanding the personas, right? The the QA person or the QA persona may be a little different than the developer persona may be a little different from a change manager or deployment manager if they have those roles. So you know I think it does it can be useful to to do things at times. Uh, to have folks get closer 
to understand, especially in large organizations where we know it's much easier to become siloed and have the communication paths be longer. I think that can be a good practice to have them partnering more closely with the teams they're supporting, their customers they're supporting. I, I totally agree. And, and, and from our, like our organization standpoint, this is something we do, you know, we have different engagement models. Some of them are, are more baseline. Like we're, like I was kind of talking before, we're providing you infrastructure. Here's how you use it. Here's an API. Um, but there's also, you know, sort of an increased engagement where you actually will go in bed with the team and, and help them achieve something. And sometimes that is like, imagine if you could do that with a, with a customer, right? It's the ultimate quick feedback in terms of the thing you're creating. And I, I find it creates a lot more happiness in the product and, uh, you know, wait times become not an issue, but you, you also are sort of careful on how directly you get engaged with that, that team that you, you pick the right times to do that basically. So there's another question I think that kind of piggybacks on, and it's asking for tips for how product teams can take an in, internal customer centric perspective without just building whatever their fellow employees ask for. It's, right. I think it's a great question, right? Similar to when, you know, task of customers may ask us to build features that would move in a direction not aligned with our overall vision. So how do you kind of move that platform team mindset from order takers to partner problem solvers? Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a slippery slope, right? You don't want to fall into sort of the servant. You, you do have to have an opinion on the product. Like one of the values that the platform team provides is sort of expertise in, in the area. So just like with a typical product request, it's really taking the thing they're asking for and, and turning it into this, the solution, the outcome that they want. You know, I, I think it's really, you know, it's kind of called the XY problem. You know, they, they come and ask for a specific implementation, but what they really want is an outcome. And I think that's, you know, from uh, uh, just with any sort of typical product is really trying to understand what they're trying to achieve and turning that into a product. Because the other thing that you have to be careful about as, as a platform team is that you're also controlling your incoming, that you have some control over what that product development looks like that, you know, you really do have to take that input. Uh, but exactly as you say, you don't want to end up as just sort of a, a different backlog for the team where they're just putting in specific implementation requests. Right, exactly. And I, I think, as David said, it, it gets into maybe doing sometimes more system thinking around what problem are they yeah. actually trying to solve? And, and I think it's a good point made in the question, what direction are we trying to get people to move in? So for example, you know, I've been in situations where we were trying to get more people to use the pipeline. Well, in that case, we didn't really want to make it easier for them not to, right? So if they wanted an audit capability or they wanted the a release on demand capability, we sort of had, you know, the criteria of what you they had to do in order to use the product in a certain way and so if there was a request to kind of short circuit that, that really isn't what we wanted to implement because, you know, we wanted the goodies they got to be based on the direction that the organization was trying to get to. So if you're using this, not only can we deliver more quickly, we also know that we're going to have our security and compliance needs are going to be yeah. checked off. Other audit needs may be checked off. So I think that's a great question and it really requires, I think, more systems thinking that you are part of what the organization is trying to do. You're not subservient to the request. And we do the same thing even as a business. You know, the external facing business products do the same thing the same way. I mean, you use Tassel as an example, but you're right. We will get requests that sometimes don't align and, and you know, we'll say, okay, what is really being asked for and is and do we have other capabilities that we can steer them to to allow them to achieve the same thing? And maybe even in a better way, um, as we yep. one of those examples refer to. Exactly. And, and I think in the better way is really one of the big value propositions your team has is to take the thing that they're imagining, maybe that's, a, that's an, even an implementation and saying, you know, I think security and compliance is a really good example of that. The platform team uh, provides some consistency to risk management. And, and, you know, teams will come to you with an implementation and you, you might say, well, you can't do it this way, but here's a better way to do it. And, and you know, that, that turns into a really positive sort of interaction when you're able to make something better than they were expecting. Yeah, that was some great questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. So next I'm, I'm going to talk about measuring value delivery. So one of the things this, this has actually come up in sort of a previous similar 
uh, webinar we did is, you know, how do platform teams uh, work more like the product development in terms of classifying their work, right? You're not just moving tickets from left to right. You're, you're, you're delivering features that your customers really, uh, really like. And, and it's such an important part to telling your story. So this, this really comes in, this is really, you know, both from a retention and, and job satisfaction and, but especially investment, you know, telling your story really, uh, becomes important without really being able to measure the value and where that value is being allocated. You, it's really difficult for you to talk about things like, you know, what, what would be the impact of extra investment in, in toil, for example, what is the, the opportunity cost of that toil, even if you're very good at measuring your value and what effect are your rate states having on your downstream internal customers and therefore the product that we're delivering and, and how can you invest to change those and what will the difference be? You know, cause as I was saying before, things like these wait states installing for your customers have a huge amplifying effect and, and you don't want to be on the negative end of that. You want to be on the positive end of that amplifying. So task talk, we use the, the flow framework and I, I'm going to dive into the flow framework a little bit. I'm not going to get, uh, super detailed about it, but I'm going to give you sort of enough information that you can get sort of the feel for what it does. I think you'll recognize a lot of the, the concepts. And at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll tell you how you can sort of get more involved in the flow framework uh, community if you want to learn more about it. Uh, so the first thing, uh, and, and the flow framework just quickly is, is really just a framework for managing software delivery. It's focused on measuring and optimizing the flow of the business value through your value stream. Uh, so in this case, through your, your platform products <clears throat> and correlating and, you know, and then being able to correlate that to business results. So, you know, those weight states, how do they tie to, to, uh, delivery of the software? All right. And so you'll, you'll kind of recognize these, especially if you use Jira or something, right? There's, there's features that's new business value that's pulled by the customer. Uh, so that might be like a story or a task or an Epic, um, defects. We all know what those are. We all have bugs. Uh, risks, you know, this is security related work. It could be compliance related. It could be governments or, or legal um, and typically pulled by the risk officer. So they're the ones that are prioritizing that. And tech debts uh, really, uh, and debts are, uh, you know, like tech decks, refactoring, upgrades, uh, you know, ways to speed uh, delivery, speed the delivery of, of features and, and value. And really that value delivery kind of falls into two categories in in those right there's the value generation which is the the feature investment uh the new the new value that you're delivering and the debt investment which actually supports the value and speeds the value delivery and then there's value protection so protecting the value that you already have you know through security or quality improvements and so one of the quite common questions you kind of get asked is well how does that apply to some of the work platform teams you know not all platform teams uh use this way of sort of categorizing their work. So I wanted to give a few examples of what this would be either than just doing tickets. And again, I think it's very important to, uh, to be categorizing your work in some way in this concept so that you can articulate where your value is going, right? If how much of your investment is going into features versus defects and, and depth. So on a platform team, something, you know, new business value features are really things like new environments or new self-serve capabilities or, or, are, you know, uh, could even be uh, introducing a new piece of software to to provide new insights like performance uh, testing. <clears throat> uh, you know, debt is really the work that you do to on your team to improve your velocity and flow time of the feature delivery. You know, and and sort of that end to end feature delivery, uh, uh, delivering value to your your customers. Uh, defects, you know, that's I think a little more obvious. Just bugs and issues found either escaped into production or or you know found in your sort of quality process. And then risks, uh, you know, this is an area where you can provide a lot of value and consistency. I think that's one of the powers of the platform team can have is by doing some of this, you know, you know, uh, SOC 2 compliance by default or, or as a service, you can provide some consistency across the organization and really protect that business value in a consistent way. Um, you know, so the, it's that type of work. So uh, making, you know, uh, uh, compliance as a service or, or uh, things just even as simple as, you know, CV driven upgrades or just security improvements for better data production. And one of the things I'm going to talk about today is experimentation as a way that uh, the team can sort of drive uh, improvements in these. Um, and typically, I think on platform teams, we think of experimentation more on the tech debt side. Uh, so, you know, uh, what would happen if we used, we upgraded this piece of software and took advantage of this new feature to, to do something but uh, that, that we deliver. But I, I think it can also 
fall in the realm of more traditional product management type experiments with features, right? You can uh, deliver new services to a subset of super users who, who try it out, or you even may take a service that you offer to one team and they really like it. You have happy customers, so you expand that to, to more customers across more teams. Um, and I think that's a really good thing to, to start sort of exercising that muscle of, of taking these smaller bets and then uh, doubling down on the things that are really working and stop doing the things that aren't. All right, so that was the flow items, the different ways the value is distributed in, in sort of your investment. And now there's the, the flow metrics. Uh, so these are uh, sort of metrics on the end-to-end -end value delivery. So they're a little bit different than something like a Dora metric was focused on software delivery outcomes. These are really metrics that are fo focused on, you know, from customer request to the, when the customer actually experiences the value the, uh, at the other end. Uh, so I'll just kind of quickly go through these. You'll, I think you'll recognize them from, from some more, you know, other, other types of, uh, of metrics, but flow velocity is really just uh, how long it takes for a flow item. So, you know, features debt uh, to be completed over a particular period of time. And again, that's end to end from when customer uh, requests it to when the customer receives it. Flow distribution. So that's sort of the percent of investment you're putting into each type of uh, uh, flow item, you know, percent of defects versus features, for example. Flow load, you can think of that as whip, but it also includes things that are accepted, so that are imminent to be worked on, and the things that are that are active. Uh, flow time, so that's really how long it takes to uh, complete uh, uh, your flow items from start to end, and then flow efficiency, which is how long, you know, what is the ratio of how long something's waiting to when it's active. <clears throat> All right, and so those metrics are very important to experimentation because they can actually, this is where I'm gonna talk a little bit about not sort of getting stuck in that local optimization and how you can use that flow framework to make sure that you're really having the effect on that value delivery. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some experimentation we did and, and how, you know, the, in general teams should, should really be able to directly engage in this. Like this works the best if the, individual contributors or the practitioners on the team are driving this, but that they also have the data to really understand what effect they're having and where they should be directing that sort of value and impact. Um, not all experiments will impact your flow, obviously. You're gonna to wanna to do uh, uh, experiments that are, that are outside of that, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more of a, an example where it did affect our flow metrics. Uh, so in our case, just to give a little bit of a context, we were working on uh, providing a new service uh, is actually a web customer facing website that was actually used by internal DevOps teams and, and practitioners to, uh, to you know, uh, deliver on-prem software and, and it's used by the field. So it has lots of stakeholders, the internal customers also has external customers. They're working on this. It's a big replacement for something that had um, been uh, replacing something that had been around for a number of years. Um, and in the meantime, also having to sort of provide all the day-to-day -day work in terms of the interrupts that can happen from internet, uh, providing internal uh, de developer platforms. Uh, so we started to notice that things were slowing down. They were starting to churn. Uh, we were getting a little bit higher width. So our flow times were becoming highly variable, which means that things were some things were finishing quick and some things were finishing, taking a lot longer to finish, even though they weren't really different. They were, they were relatively similar size, but we're taking quite a bit of different time to finish. <clears throat> We also noticed that our flow efficiency uh, was going down. So that meant that our wait times were, were increasing. And in that case, our active times were about staying the same, but our, our wait times were going up. And, and flow load, so that width, the things that are in our accepted queue that are in progress, that maybe a verification were climbing. And that was leading to the team feeling overloaded. So even though the team, you know, sort of uh, was not being asked to, to do more than they, they could, it's just the fact that this work was showing up and getting into the whip that they were starting to feel overloaded. Um, so we were able to take a look at what was going wrong in our process. And I really like this example because it's a good example where we didn't do anything that was huge, right? We didn't, we didn't uh, introduce any big tech technology or anything like that. It was actually quite a small change, but because it was uh, focused on value delivery, it had a really outsized impact in terms of, of what, what, what we did. So what we noticed here, so on this graphic here, you have the different size circles and what that, the, the big red circle on verification means 
that we were spending more time in that than we were in progress and, and accepted as well was, was spending more time in progress and accepted. We kind of expect that, but verification, uh, is a really lightweight process for us. It's basically just a done review. Somebody can typically do them in, you know, sometimes they take five minutes, sometimes they take 30 minutes sort of thing. So they're, they're very quick, but we were seeing a lot of work pile up there and also spend, spend a lot of time there. And the result of this was also having is that because it was taking a long time to finish the verification, sometimes things would be found in the done review and they'd come back and that would increase the, the whip in progress. And that was really starting to, to churn things. <clears throat> So we, we had a couple of champions off the team that were interested in, in sort of making some improvements here and they really sort of drove this experiment. So we, we came up with a hypothesis together. What's wrong? Uh, a bottleneck in verification done review wait times is leading to a high whip, therefore slower value delivery, creating a negative feedback loop. So that negative feedback loop is coming back and, and making it, you know, slowing us down even more because we're getting all that context switching. So the team came up with some actions that they wanted to do to change it. And, and as I said, there's nothing, there's nothing really big here, right? These are all pretty simple things. So we, we made some non-interrupt hours for the, for the team, no meetings within a certain block of the day. We actually moved our stand up to the end of the day to give what we felt was the most productive time, which is the morning and sort of early afternoon to just focus on work to get, to be able to focus. <clears throat> the team also decided they wanted to not take any new work, uh, uh, you know, distinct new work when, they would only take on new things when they couldn't swarm on something that was in progress or if there, you know, there wasn't anything in, in verification that needed to, to be pushed through, then they would, then they would take new things on. We also had a, a team champion. This is actually across two teams, team champions to uh, help ensure verification is done on a timely process, just to make sure that, that we're paying it, you know, paying attention to it and to start building that, that habit in. And in terms of value delivery, we had some really good results from such a simple little experiment. So on the left here, we have flow load and you can see the different colors represent the different flow items. And on the right here, we have flow time. <clears throat> so the light green are the wait states and the dark green are the, the in progress states. And you can see, so we've, we've marked here where we, we made the process change and, and we actually kind of swarmed on the verification. So it made quite an, an immediate change in terms of the wait times that started to come come through. Um, and one thing I'll point out here is when you look at the light green and the dark green, if we had been sort of trying to fix things by fixing, you know, optimizing something with the, the active work, the in-progress work, we would have not been able to have nearly the impact as we did in terms of the wait time. So by really reducing the wait times, you can see they drop quite dramatically after the change. Uh, we were able to deliver value much quicker to our customers. And this, this is really important. So Carmen, I, you had a really great analogy when we were talking about this previously is, you know, this is like getting an oil change for your car and that oil change, you know, it only takes five minutes, but they have your car for six days. You know, that was the equivalent of what we were, were doing before. The customer doesn't care that the oil change only takes 10 minutes. You have their car for 10 days. So this had a really big impact on the value that our customers were, were getting it, it, it and, and it, didn't really have a really big impact on what we were doing. It, you know, it was the same amount of work and it was, uh, but, it, but it had a really big impact because we focused the experiment in the right area. The team was able to sort of hone in on what they wanted to change. So, yeah, I think that's a great, great point, a great story, Dave. And I think it can also apply, you know, it's it gets into, and you, we hear this a lot, right? We, well, we all, we need to be more customer obsessed and, what does that really mean? Well, I, I think what it means sometimes is we're all customers. You know, we're both provider. You know, we're both providers and customers in life, right? And and so we have to put that hat on. Of okay, if you were the customer here, what would your perspective be, right? What would what would you be valuing? And 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 I don't know if you can go back, David, a couple of slides, but but this can also come into play when when your customers, you know, the internal teams that are using the platform are looking at their value stream. So this could be a typical situation where, you know, I'm on a business product team and we're delivering something, a new, a new financial product or a change in a financial product to, a, to, an end, to, to our customers, to our website. And it maybe it also shows a verification. And when you dig into it, you know, and this is a real example that I experienced. It was an issue of 
of how long it took for some of their automated tests to run. So before they could move further into the release process, they needed to run a set suite of automated tests. And these tests took more than a day to run. And so when they thought, when they dug into it, it was because they were limited into how many environments they had to run parallel tests. So an experiment with the platform team was to, you know, use a technology, for example, Docker, and this time this was kind of a, an older story, but to spin up some ability to spin up multiple environments. And so by doing that, they were able to reduce their time from over a day to a few minutes, which you know had a considerable impact on their ability to deliver. And especially under duress, if they had to make a quick change, they can now run their complete automation suite in a few minutes and feel comfortable and confident in deploying. So, so if the platform team in isolation just said, hey, wouldn't it be cool for us to adopt this new technology? People would say, well, why? What, what's that going to buy us? What's the case? What's the story? But by partnering with their customer, they were able to produce a very powerful story that then allowed them to implement a new technology that helped them not just in this case, but in many other cases you know, across um, the value stream and the process. So, so being able to understand this and use it both internally and also understanding where your customers' weight states are and how maybe you can contribute to the, helping those, you know, can not only help them, but also allow you to, to improve your own capability to deliver no, more functionality for customers in general. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the, the great things about viewing it this way, like you touched on and sort of being more customer centric and, and for this, it, you know, for us, it's really, I think it's easy sometimes when you're working on things and you're like, well, this thing took a long time. So, you know, we need to work on some secrets management or something, and that's really going to speed it up the next time. But to look at it more as that value delivery that's going to your team. So exactly like you say, helping them with their uh, uh, weight states and in uh, and, and ways that you can, you know, understand what challenges they're having, but, but also being able to tie that to what you're providing them, right? So I talked earlier about how those those type of things can have can amplify through the organization and that you should be able to tell that story. And this is the type of thing, if you're not measuring your value and especially not measuring things like weight states, it's really difficult to tell that story, right? Here we can, uh, in terms of, of what we're delivering to them, it, it, it is much better for the customer, but it's also better for the team because things aren't sitting around for, for 25 days and piling up and people asking when they're gonna be done, things are, uh, you know, sort of deliver quickly and you get fast feedback on those. Yeah, good. a good exercise I've seen I've seen done is to take, you know, maybe not on every retrospective, but a few, you know, a few times during a retrospective um, and ask, you know, put up two, two sheets of paper, or create two lists, right? One is what are your internal pain that you're feeling and what's stopping you from going faster what pain are you experiencing as a team and but then also put a sheet up and say well, what do we think our customers biggest pain points are and then you know work to validate those i mean do we really understand them and and then once you have that you know how can those become some of the features and things on your roadmap that you can start to address i think it gets back to the question about order takers to problem solvers i mean yeah. The customers yeah. will really want you to solve their problems. They may be asking for things that appear to be orders, but really, if you can be solving their problems, you're going to have much happier, more satisfied, more productive customers. And and we've definitely had, you know, that that's one of the reasons it's really important to understand your customers as well and what challenges they're having, because we've definitely had the, the situation where we solve the problem for one team. And then we realize, hey, this team over here is having this problem and they don't realize how to fix it. We can now take that product to them. And, and, and you know, we've actually already had a test bed over here. We've learned some things and we can we can apply it to another team who didn't even realize that that was an option. All right. So that that just about wraps it up. I just want to have a couple of summary slides. So just, you know, shifting this this thinking from project to product and really changing that focus really allows platform teams to tell their story and to demonstrate that they are a positive return on investment. You know, every dollar spent here has an amplifying effect up the chain. Uh, we're not just a cost center to, to you know, constantly be managed from, from a cost perspective. 
and it really allows teams to engage and understand their value and, and to, to feel valued within the organization. And I really do think those things really contribute a lot to how your team gets invested in and the happiness of that team as well. Uh, so just to wrap up, as I said, uh, uh, you know, before we jump into more questions, uh, this wanted to let you know about the uh, Flow Framework. There's a Slack community uh, and Flow Institute where you can learn more about Flow Metrics and Flow Framework. Uh, there's on-demand courses or workshops, roundtables, and networking. I'm in that Slack community, so so definitely feel free to uh, message me there or or message on sort of the general channels and stuff. And, and if you want to ask any more questions, and that's it. And I guess I can leave, you know, with one final thought. I don't know if we'll get any more questions, which is, you know, another thing I think is useful is to keep your pulse on the happiness of the team itself. So, so all we've talked about customers and obviously we want happy customers. We also know that happy teams are productive and productive teams are happy. And so by, you know, whether you use, you know, employing that promoter score or something, keeping your pulse on the happiness of the team is important because we found that if that starts to waver, that means there's probably something going south in our process, right? Either there's too much whip or they're not able to work on technical debt or something. And so you, know, you need to understand the happiness factor of the team um, because I think that's a key component of of obviously everything we've been talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe we didn't touch on that enough, but exactly that, you know, if you're doing sort of internal NPS or, or something like that, you know, uh, incorporating that in into these these metrics is really important and watching that. And um, I mean, it's interesting when you do because you can kind of see the patterns exactly like you're saying, Carmen, if when the teams get overloaded and that flow load goes up, you can see things dropping, but it also gives a, a sort of discussion point on on what needs to be improved, what where what is the, the sort of problem. And I, you know, and, and even from a customer perspective too, in terms of the happiness that they're experiencing uh, can be driven by some of the, the products that they're in, uh, in, uh, engaging with as well and, and, you know, how that's working for them. Excellent. Well, I don't see any questions right now, but in the meantime, I'd like to remind everybody that today's webinar has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the webinar, you'll be able to watch it again. We will be sending an email with the link to access the webinar on demand, and you can also find it on devops.com. Just look in the, the uh, webinars page and it should be there. Uh, I did mention at the beginning that we were doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So I'll go ahead and announce the winners. Our first winner today is uh, Muhammad E. Congratulations. Our second winner is Steve W. Our third winner is Jeffrey P. And our final winner is Tiffany D. So congratulations to all our winners. We'll be reaching out to you via email with instructions for claiming your Amazon gift card. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see it there, check your spam folder. Just going to look at the Q&A one more time. I don't see anything else. Uh, David and Carmen, thank you so much for taking the time to put this presentation together and for uh, giving us an hour of your day to present. We all really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent. I'd also like to thank the audience for their time and engagement. This is Julio Godinez signing off until next time. Take care, everyone.